Greetings, beloveds, and welcome to another episode of How We Did It. I am joined once again by Giovanni, and this time we're going to talk more about economics. You know, we've been addressing Black wealth, uh, online businesses, real estate, just anything to help bolster our economy. And so today, however, I want to address a topic that conservatives, I don't think, do a good enough job um, evaluating or dissecting. So we're going to talk about gentrification. We're going to talk about um, redevelopment, urban development, all of these buzzwords that we often hear. We're going to get some perspective on uh, how these different government initiatives affect individuals in various communities, and perhaps there can be a conservative solution to the various problems. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Giovanni to reintroduce himself to the audience, and uh, we're just going to jump right in. Giovanni, how are you? Talk to us. I am wonderful. Thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. Yes. So, you know, like when I'm on Twitter class and if I raise a, a discussion question, I sometimes know like, okay, Bonnie's going to hop in. I just know it. I, just know <laughs> <laughs> I know he's going to hop in and you're going to give some yeah, in-depth, some nuance to the topic. So if you don't mind, let's just go ahead and start off with uh, the topic about Black wealth and gentr gentrification, Ooh, say that five times fast. <laughs> so um, let's just start there. You know, the gentrification has this really negative connotation uh, when I'm speaking to certain folks. And I think for me, it's about trying to understand uh, the historical context, uh, things along that nature. And I guess, let me preface it like this. So uh, that question I raised in Twitter class was inspired by this Facebook post I saw where this one woman, she follows me, and she was sharing pictures of Augusta, Georgia. And it looked really- That's where I'm from! Oh, okay. Did you know that? I no. lived there until I was like 12 or 13, yeah. As okay. much as I talk about DC, you know, folks don't know I'm from Georgia and Augusta. Yes. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> all of these pictures of these dilapidated homes, rundown neighborhoods, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is rough. And so my thinking is, well, what's the problem with gentrification? If the idea is to come into these areas, revitalize it, and then boom. But then there's also the context of, is this displacement? Is this da 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 So I want you to give us a general breakdown of what this phrase means, and then we'll move mm -hmm. on from there. All right, so um, a good example would be um, in high school, I went to um, school in DC, um, and to be historically correct. Um, I had mentioned before, I don't know, I think I did with your show, that I had a bit of karma as it pertains to charter schools. And we discussed that I went to two charter schools and I used an address where I did not live and both schools ended up being bad. And I said, see, that's what you get because it shouldn't have been going there in the first place. But the address that I used was of Northwest DC and Uncle Northwest. Um, that is the more affluent neighborhood, uh, affluent part of town. Um, he was in a you know rather trendy neighborhood now. Um, I would say that probably everything in the Detroit Park is a million dollars. But point being, I remember in high school discussing where we all lived and someone said, oh, you live in Northwest, you must be rich. And a lot of the more affluent people are from there. Um, to put in, um, into context, the person who said this was from Southwest East. And so there's lots of housing projects there. And as someone who had worked in real estate in the past, I did real estate marketing in um, the 2000s um, and worked with a number of agents. The most of what I knew of was to the 50s. I didn't know any more context beyond then because what all the property I saw was from the 50s. Well, why is that? The entire quadrant of Southwest DC was bulldozed, a fourth, one fourth of the city. And so <laughs> that's it really insane. Wow. And so, I mean, the entirety of it. And so the justification was, I um, mean, this was a Supreme Court case that said that they wanted to, this was, done for beautification and slum clearance. Um, we might've heard of slum clearance. Um, that's a you know, pretty known term in the uh, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and so a hardware store owner said, he, in his pictures, you could see of the neighborhood before, look perfectly fine. He said, this is not a slum, what are you doing? And he sued. And the government said, ah, but beautification. We can, and so the ending explanation was that the government can take 
anything that they want, literally anything, if they choose that it needs to be beautified. Mm. And there went the whole neighborhood and people, you know, had been displaced all over ta- all over the city, you know. And so this is part of the reason why you have like the concentration of poverty today, um, because you had all these housing projects. A lot of us know that housing projects, have, it's been difficult to maintain them. Um, city governments are responsible for doing it. Um, the federal government occasionally throws a little something here and there. And so they just eventually started to uh, fall apart. But that is a good example um, of displacement. Rarely do you have an entire side of town taken down, at least to the extent of a quarter um, mm. <laughs> uh, of a city. And so people would look now and say, well, this is great. And here we are again, actually, now they want to tear down some more things and build you know, new stuff. And I'm like, aha, remember what happened the last, <laughs> you know, the last time. Because all you did was just pick up folks and, and um, move them elsewhere. Something else that occurred on the south side of town, I specifically remember a property whereby when it comes to removing people from public housing, Mm -hmm. they tend to be told that we're going to, it's literally a law, one-to-one place, you have to move them somewhere. It just tends to not happen. Mm -hmm. Things conveniently occur and folks just find somewhere else to go on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, A woman here, I think that that her property was torn down in 2006, seven, and she just ended up down here 130 miles down in Petersburg and they literally just now built the replacement for her property. How many years later is this? 15 years? <laughs> um, lots of lawsuits for that. You have families who had in public housing, there could be three, four bedroom apartments. And then you rebuild things. You don't have houses that have space for that number of um, uh, family members. And it's intentional. You rebuild something that might, that only has all studios in one bedroom, like mm-hmm. 10 two bedrooms. And so, well, the rest of them, and you're like, this is what you have, or go like take a voucher elsewhere. This is just the environment that's set up. Um, the lawsuits fly because they're like, you you want these people out of the city. You clearly want them out of the city. You're not providing it, providing anywhere else um, mm-hmm. for them to go. And this dates back to like in DC and in some other areas. It started with, you know, the public housing in the 50s. You have some people you might have not. Um, you know, redlining, there wasn't much opportunity there, clearly up to just about today. And you're looking to tear things down again. And it's a cycle of just moving people around in real estate, like a checkerboard, versus trying to deal with the actual economic issue that some of these individual people are having. And not to mention just the insidious part of um, getting rid of people that's what a lot of this, a lot of the policy that people object to when we discuss gentrification is about. Wow. Okay. So let's back up a little bit. And <laughs> in one simple term, how would you define gentrification? Gentrification, I believe, is when you have policies that are set up to directly target a demographic for displacement. Okay. okay. Under the guise of redevelopment and making a better and a more improved community. Okay. So as you're talking, selling people, um, selling people under the bus. Okay. As you're talking, <clears throat> it sounds like. Um, and that was only public housing, really. I trust. <laughs> your definition <laughs> of gentrification seems different than just some private investor going in, buying the block, redeveloping it working with the community. There's totally nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Okay. So there's a difference. Yeah. People, yeah, people are happy. Yeah. The people are happy to have folks come in and do things. You know, let's just not try and target to get rid of folks. You know, I remember on in, in Twitter class I mentioned there's a neighborhood, H Street DC, mm-hmm. whereby this was a black corridor. All you know, all black businesses. It was known as a bit of a black Wall Street, not as much as like U Street is known um mm-hmm. in pop in popular culture. Um a Street, I just remember sitting, I just can describe all of it as evil. I mean, number one, they tore up the street for a streetcar. Um, this is probably less racist as it is just incompetent government, although I don't know. They tore the street up, it took forever to do. They paved it, they forgot to put the lines to the ground, they took it back up. This has to have lasted, like, I don't know, eight, <laughs> eight years 
all the black businesses were gone. I met a woman who was running for office as a Republican in that in that neighborhood. Uh, I was just name dropper, Mary Brooks Beatty. And uh, just coincidentally, she told me, oh yeah, 8th Street, you know, all those new businesses there, new businesses there, I'm responsible for them. They're all friends of mine. I said, oh really? Hmm. And so I remember when I remember when that street was inaccessible for years and people could not, people couldn't, um, you know, make it through there. And so they had to go to business. And I remember, but I remember they had um, business relief that was set up. What year did that happen? Then now I'm interrogating. And she told me when it occurred, I think it might've been, I just remember this stuff starting really heavy in 07. I barely could get there on foot. Okay. And this was 2011, I think I met her. And I think it might have happened a year before I said, oh, so the relief happened after everybody left. Mm. And then that would explain why. But the relief went to all of her friends who now have businesses, the new people. So you should pay people to come, come and take folks' businesses. That's a one of the gentrification uh, aspects people don't like. And they were sitting around openly. This was like written about by reporters saying, we don't want chicken restaurants. We don't want hat shops. We don't want barber shops. All the time, all of those were the black businesses that were there. And people said, yeah. "Hey, you can't do that. That's illegal. Oh my! God. It's illegal and it, that's racist as hell." I mean, it was there was a bit of a tough area um, as well. But and so after they were told they couldn't do it, they said, "Okay, be right back." And they went and tried to find other ways around doing it. Wow. And, and that's why like, I hold this woman responsible for what happened there because she took responsibility for the neighborhood. Um, wow. You know what I mean? Things have, have completely changed and what will end up happening is it will be a scenario of like, I remember going to a meeting of a group on um, not too far from there called the River East Emerging Leap. And I told the council member, I said, I'm never going there again because they said, you see the people in this room? And they were, you could argue that they're gentrifiers, but they're you know newcomers trying to do things. I don't really like using that word. I was called a gentrifier based on how I look, despite renting. <laughs> how am I gentrifier? I don't own anything. What the hell? Yeah. Um, but they said when the dust settles, uh -huh. the people in this room are going to be the last one standing. And I said that is the most obnoxious, <laughs> condescending thing I've ever heard anyone say about the neighborhood. What do you mean you're going to be left? So, so who's everyone else? Just sitting ducks. Yeah. You know, what do we, <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, th that is what occurred in some of the more insidious uh, ways of gentrification for H Street. And the narrative will be, you know, people are going to take credit later on. And they said, yes, it was, it was us and our, and our investment and our money and our smarts, you know, because we're smarter than everyone else. If, if the neighborhood changed, the other people would have done it. Ignoring the fact that it takes, you know, a multitude of partners over several years. Most development plans take about 20 years, you know, to happen. But folks do pop in and, you know, tinker with stuff mm -hmm. um, to make things difficult. I've known folks who've had their property taxes raised in three digits mm -hmm. above 500%. Um, just think about that, <laughs> that number on paper. Yeah. Um, you know, just for the sake of literally targeting folks to get rid of them. And I can say this because I know that's for a fact. Um, but that's just what people um, ignore. It really is more than just having folks um, mm -hmm. investing and flipping homes. People would actually like to see more folks, you know, more of that happening. People talk about this in poor communities that if mm -hmm. others saw the value, then, you know, things would be a lot, would be a lot better. Yeah. We'd see the well, value in your investment. The second guy I interviewed does that. He goes, he buys the block. He went and bought um, several homes in his old neighborhood and the community love it. Like, what city is this? Uh, somewhere in Houston, Houston, Texas. And, okay. uh, you know, his community obviously loves it. They love everything that he's, he's doing and building. So when we were talking gentrification, I think he was more so coming from this perspective of a general term where it's just to, like you were saying, beautify the neighborhood. But then it seems like you're talking about a full weight of the government coming in and back. Yeah, most, mostly government and the Karens and the, you know, the, the, yeah. the wicked folks. Like, and and I, I say it because like there are people who, and I tend to defend a lot of these things. You know, most major cities are desirable places in real estate. 
They are. Anyone who claims otherwise is a lie. But there are people who will, you know, run the gamut of, of constantly, you know, constantly bashing. And so if you can if you can have a media narrative of things being ter terrible, then you can come back and I can show. Look at this. Look at the news over the last eight months. Over the last year, it's terrible. We've tried everything. So let me do this. Let me bulldoze these 12 blocks. And that's what happened. And so this is why I tell folks and I pick on certain media people because yeah. I'm like, you're contributing to this. I can explain, like Chicago has the most Fortune 500 companies in the country, um, our headquarters, that is. Um, you could easily partner with them and try to convince them to work with, um, you know, children in certain communities. But they're not going to do that if the news is garbage. You know, there are plenty of selling points. It just takes actual work um, mm -hmm. to do so. If I was with one of those companies, just like when I was at the World Bank, um, we had a um, an internship program for high school students. And I had to I had to talk to someone to explain to them because all they knew of was DC public schools and it has its reputation. I said, look, this is the World Bank. This is a collegiate environment. Um, you know, that's where I Ivanka almost got her, her mm -hmm. role. I know it wasn't going to happen, you know, when they were trying to get her to leave the place. I said, look, no one's sending bad kids here. Believe me. <laughs> They're going to come from one of the best schools. They're likely going to have high GPAs. No one wants to be embarrassed sending a child in here. So you're fine. Like, that was me convincing them. I was helping with this in trying to bring in, um, you know, high school students to get more people involved. That's the type of thing that needs to be done. Um, in, in cities like Chicago, but it, it takes work. Like when, when I worked in the mayor's um, office as, as a um, executive assistant, we had a PR budget. Um, and part of it is for that reason, you have to change hmm. the perception. And we were at one point in time purchasing and flipping homes to become um, uh, smart homes. Um, I, I tend to be you know, back and forth about it. You know, if you do it, it works. Maybe not necessary, but we did such a great job of branding the city. At one point, we didn't have anything to buy because people were buying stuff all on their own. Okay. And okay. that was, of course, from our jobs of what we were doing. But at the same time, the fact that we were able to help in changing um, the, the reputation of the area. Mm. So you mentioned something in Twitter class about PR, which we're kind of merging into that. And you were saying how media outlets let's use fox we're on you know we can talk about fox and how it talks about Chicago. i love potentially left their name out <laughs> <laughs> so for once i want to leave them alone <laughs> i got a demo uh, and how they're talking about you know certain cities so negatively and you were saying that plays a part in gentrification that absolutely 100 percent. elaborate please um, so, I mean, if you can have just a, a, a narrative, it even works with politics, right? Things are so bad. And then you can just say that, well, we've tried everything. People tend to say this to me a lot. We've done everything, especially with the Blacks. We've done everything for the Blacks. You know, we've given them this. We've given them that. You know, there's nothing else to do. Forget them. <laughs> I mean, and I, I think of, like, there are certain neighborhoods. Like I, I used to live three doors away from um, the former mayor of DC, um, Vince Gray. And it was an affluent, affluent black neighborhood, Hillcrest, but and I, had, I really hadn't explored my neighborhood. You go a couple blocks over, which I discovered after a number of years living there. And there was one block where I said, all, every crime, every crime category that I could think of occurred in that one block. <laughs> and it's one of those things like there are areas that are like that where you're like so much money is spent in the city why is it some neighborhoods are it's like they allow it you know um there's a public housing project um um what was it called um the worst one in the city i can't think of it um <laughs> but berry farms that was it and it's just it was like they just allow this stuff to happen and sometimes you have to ask yourself why is this continuing? Some of it, of course, is, my, is for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. But if there's so much money in the city and you're just, there's just this confined space, then I'm concerned I don't trust anybody because you're, you're allowing this to just all collapse. 
And part of that is that, well, if I let it collapse, let's just give it five more years and let everybody, let, let them shoot themselves, you know, let the trash keep up. And what's going to happen? The community is going to complain. The problem is going to take care of itself. People are going to ask about it, you know, uh, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you come in and say, well, got to tear it down. Wow. <laughs> and that is managed chaos. Yeah. Um, and you know, even that neighborhood. Some of the best views of the city of DC are from Berry Farms. The second concert that I produced as a teenager, I was mm -hmm. 20, um, occurred um, in that neighborhood. It cliffs like a mountaintop view mm -hmm. um, of the city. And now you've got property in the area near a million dollars. But you got to, you know, you got to get rid of us Negroes first. You know, so you got to, you got to tear the neighborhood down. I remember Marion Barry. Um, you know, former mayor for life, God rest his soul, um, making a comment once his car was broken into. This is years ago, like 08. And he was on the news saying, well, that's what happens when you live in the ghetto. And the community was mad <laughs> because he said, we're already trying to change this place. You're not helping. <laughs> um, but no, the media narrative 100% um, plays a part. Let's say, for instance, I'm a grocery store. Um, and I'm from the, the corporate headquarters. I want to move into a new neighborhood. I want to come to DC. So what would I do? I'm going to look at the statistics. Okay, where where the rest of the store? All of them are in. It's a neighborhood called Columbia Heights. All right, mm -hmm. I'm going to go over there. You know, crime rate seems low. They all everybody. It works very well. So I'm going to do. But it takes effort to change the narrative of other places. That means that I have to go to there's like a, a, an annual um, franchise conference in Vegas. I would have to go find people, talk to them, and convince them that my neighborhood mm -hmm. um, is worth going to. But that's going to take extra work, extra money, mm -hmm. um, all of those things. Like, you know, for myself to have worked in, in cities like where I am, Petersburg, Virginia, I just got the wonderful news today that we now have the highest unemployment in the, in the state of <laughs> Virginia. Oh, no. I do PR. So, like, every time this happens, it just makes things worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, even where I lived in D.C., look it up, the neighborhood was Hillcrest Heights. A lot of elected officials came from Hillcrest Heights. Now homes are pushing a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Most, even the tiniest of things, are the, you'd be hard-pressed to find something for um, 450. But they couldn't, get, um, they couldn't get retail in the area. That doesn't make sense. How is it that everyone's house is six and seven hundred thousand dollars and you can't find something to build? Everybody's in, that's the mayor got up and yelled at once in office, in office. Everybody's incompetent. I'm like, wait a minute now, I'm a part of everybody. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense. Like an economic development director, you can get rid of him, someone who's yeah. under him, the council member maybe. I like the council member, but, you know, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. How can you not get something for people who have, and you're supposed, you're supposed to at least take care of people with money. Not supposed to say that, but that's kind of a given that most of us expect. If those people aren't taken care of and are upset, you ju you just stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just saying, like it, it takes extra effort. It would have taken some type of creativity um, mm -hmm. to to bring something there. I mean, I even did so here. I was talking about finding bringing in all these here. It mm -hmm. takes work. Look, I have made a whole list of all the selling points. Mm -hmm. um, the stores now, Aldi's and Starbucks. They are now moving into cities. Starbucks is oversaturated um, in most uh, downtown areas. So now they're looking to more poorer communities. I was making a pitch for one to, or working on one, trying to, to come here. And all of the, you know, positives of being in Petersburg. Um, all these in their description list, they have to move to their smaller stores now. So like, I didn't have to, I can avoid their parking lot size requirements. Mm -hmm. um, we only have one intersection in the whole city that meets their requirement for traffic. And I'm like, this is going to have to work. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to reach the owner of a property at that corner to sell. But this is, this is just effort to try and, you know, make the place sellable um, to bring people here. But there are folks, when I see people who constantly make an effort uh, effort to drag the city, like our social media is full of people from outside of the city that are always dragging Petersburg. And sometimes I always say, I don't know why you're doing it. I want to find out. Why is it all these people who don't live here, all in the vicinity are always talking trash? What is your, excuse me, what is your motive? Yeah. You know, what 
are you getting out of doing this? I know that it's something. I'm going to find out. <laughs> so all that stuff matters. All of this matters. And so the way that it's perceived, it's almost like everybody is, <laughs> I don't want to call it a conspiracy. I, I feel like that's just out of I was, I was accused of being a conspiracy when I, I first came. The, the community's largest uh, watchdog group. Um, I got into it with the, the owner to the point that I was, I was blocked. I wrote an article against them. I dragged her. I was <laughs> with the newly formed GOP at the time. Yeah. And she asked him, please tell Vanya Lee you know, <laughs> to say something to him. We finally met. I'm in the restaurant. I told at the coffee shop and I told the woman at the uh, cat told the cashier, I said, so um, I said, you know, we have a history. So mm -hmm. if you hear a little tussling or anything back here, I'm just kidding, this is the older woman. Yeah. Um, just know just know that it's been, there's a history with us. We're fine. <laughs> just call, just shut the door. <laughs> Let us battle it out. Um, but you know, now we're friends. Um, I'm, I'm one of her admins. Um, so I'm accusing me of being an opportunist because I like jump ship to, to go over there. Um, I love engaging the community. She does the, <laughs> does the most of it. But when we met, she was hell bent on telling me about how she just felt like I was fear mongering because I was using all these examples from DC. People used to fight and beat people up. The police would come to community meetings. People are fighting over the real estate in the city. Mm. And so, you know, Fox and whatnot in the drive-by footage of Detroit and Chicago. Augusta's a beautiful city, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. I, you know, I, the last time I was there a few years ago, um, sort of mother's funeral in 2018, I was like, I could 100% if I felt that I could um, just 100% be virtual, because I feel like I'm around 91 or something. Now, mm -hmm. Um, I would 100% be there. There's a George Brown statue still under the condo there. I want to be right across the street so I can <laughs> be in tune with him. Um, but uh, yes, the perception um, is key. Just what you were saying about Augusta. I mean, but so much of the rest of the city is very nice. Okay. But you never know it, right. you know, by how some, by, by how some people, um, how some people tell it. Wow. That, that's amazing to me. Is there any example in which gentrification from this government has done something positive and everybody just, just like, thank you? <laughs> you know, I, there are some positive attributes to it. Mm -hmm. And I, because everything is connected, you know, it's, it's, you're not going to please everyone. And I can only <laughs> praise the parts where people um, have been held. Um, the, the city that I, you know, worked in, the city of Maryland, um, we did our, um, you know, home flipping, and we had an affordable um, housing trust fund, which a lot of cities um, do have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, purchasing a lot of the <clears throat> because I mean, it has to start somewhere. We could say that well, you know, citizens need to buy this stuff, and it's like, well, what happened when they don't? You know, um, sometimes it takes a little public investment to uh, spark some interest in the, the private sector. That's another story. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of cities that have purchased property, um, you know, uh, chosen to either flip and sell them or just to put them on the market um, under, say, affordable housing programs or programs whereby you would be eligible for, um, you know, renovation loans. Um, those are things that are great. I remember there was something in DC called the Marshall Heights Development Corporation. And I, they had a home, they had home buying classes and one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching. And I just remember, um, like I had met with some people there, I had some meetings and I remember asking one, so the next class, how many people have signed up for it? Mm -hmm. Three people. Mm -hmm. And so you have a whole neighborhood that's destined for redevelopment and you, you know, Mm -hmm. Nobody's going. Mm -hmm. um, that would that would have been a good example um, yeah. of something. But I've known plenty of people, you know, who have benefited um, mm -hmm. from having some of those purchases. Mm -hmm. um, I could say that, and, and I remember, like uh, the neighborhood of Anacostia. I mm -hmm. met someone who ran from there, and I said that there is. There's 25% of the neighborhood owns their homes. 
that's pretty bad. That means that the majority of the community is subject to be displaced. You know, should something happen, and we know that the neighbor's going to pop off. He yeah. said, I said, so what is your solution to that? And he mentioned putting some more money into a particular first-time home buyer's fund, which okay. I didn't like the answer to. That's the start. But this is about economics, you know? And, and so, like, the issue that I had, and if someone wants to uh, pick this apart, they can, with the opportunity zones, it's just that I felt that you're focused on having people to open um, businesses in an area, which I think is great. However, the issue is, the real crux of the issue is, aside from blight and whatnot, is you have people who are either unemployed or underemployed. Okay. Um, we know that when certain you know, real estate goes up, the mm-hmm. prices are going to go up. And these people, if they're not employed or you know, uh, employed at a decent level, they're going to be gone. How do we prevent that? Yeah. And that might be from, um, you know, job readiness programs that could either be government funded. You could have um, the community the community development block grants that every city has. Um, is money that's given to nonprofits um, mm-hmm. to help them do what they need to do. You know, a lot of this community work, it's not, it's not cheap, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. time consuming. And they can help with both the job, the job readiness. They could both help with... Um, helping have businesses start so that it's not just the government doing it. You know, you're doing this. They're just, you know, aiding, aiding a little bit with it. Um, but to try to help in getting people um, to a level of whereby they they could be employed to stay in the community. That should be the focus. And just too often, it's not. I tell folks that you should be, as an elected official, you should be is concerned about the people who actually live there as yeah. the people that you want to govern. Too many people are focused on future residents and not who's around them. Wow, okay. Your, your analysis is pretty much the same thing that I got from the other gentleman. Mm-hmm. So they're not saying that they're pro, you know, government coming in, displacing everybody and da 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 they all pretty much said they have to, these folks seem to be focused on the community. And that's what makes such a big difference. It's just that we, like you're talking, there's just so many greedy folks who just see the land, they see the real estate and they don't see the people involved with it. Do you think this is the problem with big government? I think it's a, so part of it is big government. I think it's a problem. And so a lot of, most people who get into government tend to be of higher socioeconomic classes. I was talking about talking to someone who doesn't know much about, um, you know, politics. This just sounds like you need a lot of money to run for office. And I said, yeah, which yeah. becomes the problem that this is why you have so many tone deaf people, yeah. you know, who have a whole class of folks that they don't have any idea of what, what yeah. to do with them. Like the guy who I told you said in an interview with me, why do people, why do people watch so much television? Sir! Can we have anything? Damn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, it is, it's, it, you know, there's, there's lots of, of greedy people and you, you have to have culturally competent folks. Mm-hmm. If you don't know, then you need to go and talk to someone. I'll add, and I could be wrong. God can strike me here in this interview if I am. <laughs> I keep feeling like the, the governor of the state of Virginia keeps coming. He keeps coming to my city. I'm telling you, he keeps getting... He keeps, he's like keeping a tally of saying that, you know, I came to see them okay. and, but he never talks to anybody. Okay. <laughs> he never speaks to the public and there are people who get really mad at me talking about it. I can only say what I see. If he wasn't doing it, I wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is how you find out the issues of folks. Look, you're going to have to take it one way. <laughs> you're going to have to take the hit. One way or the other, yes, people are going to have their opinions about you. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to, you're going to have to learn. Yeah. Um, but you know, big government. I look at one of the main things I've never been a fan of is stadiums. Stadiums tend to be, um, you know, publicly financed. There's a lot of aesthetic advantages to it. You build a stadium, you get all these shops around it. That's nice. Yeah. But um, the the main example I could think of, um, forget which part of California. I think it's Oakland. 
where right after the announcement of the stadium, the sheer announcement, and people's rent doubled. Mm. It didn't, didn't just double, but they were given a three month notice. Most people can't, I can't think of many people who can just up and go in a 90 day period. Yeah. Um, that causes a huge problem. Even where I used to live in DC, I remember just the announcement of some stuff near me mm. and the signs of, you know, new expensive property. They couldn't wait. Mm. Um, but again, these are, you know, these are the folks. Um, to think about the fact that the government's willing to spend money on something that stadiums do not pay for themselves. Yeah. Out of the general 20-year lifespan that they have, by the time this, the team wants a new stadium and then leaving in two decades, they're still paying for it. All of that taxable revenue still doesn't pay for it. The city is on the hook for it, mm -hmm. and they very well could have to like raise taxes because you're going to have to tear the damn thing down yeah and finish you know and finish the loan it's just you know things just look nicer and yeah. you no longer have to deal with certain people wow and that is that is the act of government it's hard but it's hard to tell people that folks folks like stadiums you yeah. know the, the mayor of dc i remember she had a map of like she she wanted all these stadiums okay right? so she wanted to she really wanted to boost her DC sports, but we you have an affordable housing problem. Mm. It's really hard to do both. Right. Um, I don't see a stadium as a necessity. There's a lot of attractions in DC already. One stadium is something. Yeah. You want like six of them. Like that's insane. Wow. <laughs> Out of the six, it's at least four or yeah. five. I think there's two stadiums within close to a mile. It's got to be maybe a mile and a half. Do you know what that would do for real estate prices nearby? That's ridiculous. Yeah. So you're just jacking up the prices. There's even a wealthy neighborhood. It's now a wealthy neighborhood. It wasn't when I worked over when I worked there um, 10 years ago near RFK Stadium. Every time I walked outside for lunch, the mm -hmm. police were catching someone trying to keep the drunk man from falling off the falling off the bridge. Wow. The the old lady twerking in front of the carryout every day <laughs> but that neighborhood gentrified it's expensive they don't even want a stadium because they're afraid when rich people don't want you know but when they're concerned about their money you know that it's serious and so to want to put all of these stadiums if, if that if they put another stadium near rfk that would be three within like a couple miles of radius huh. um which it's it's just it's going to drive up the prices you already have an affordable housing um, program. Um, I, I can't think of what that's called. The fund that's at least two hundred million a year put into the construction of um, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple categories that I'll we'll go into that now. Um, but you're spending so much to keep prices down while you're actively contributing to the problem. Yeah, is it possible? So that, that's an example. That's an example of government. Fixing something that you're start, that you're creating. Is Create a problem to go fix. To have the affordable housing and this new development. I mean, and by new development, I'm saying like stadium. You know, there's other types of, of development. Stadiums are expensive. We're talking near a billion dollars. Right. It's possible to do it, but you, so now we're just talking it's just dollars. Now we're talking all of these tax dollars to offset stuff. You're offsetting something that you just that you created. Yeah. And it's just, you know, to have a community that's, that's changing so quickly yeah. um, and to have people who, um, <laughs> who already are so underemployed. I went yeah. to a few high schools and do you know that I have hardly, and I worked across the city, I almost have never seen anyone I went to high school mm -hmm. in the D.C. area. And that just goes to show how things are so divided um, among class. Mm. And it's just, you know, if you care about those residents, um, you know, some would say, well, you can't save everybody, yeah. but I mean, but should you be creating the problem as yeah. well? I, I just, if I think about necessity, I just don't picture having like five stadiums um, <laughs> in a city um, as being some type of a necessity. It's just, you know, it, you'll spend so much trying to offset offset that it's, it's hard to imagine yeah. it being worthwhile you know what i mean 
Yeah, I'm thinking about Atlanta, the Mercedes Benz Stadium. Like, I don't want to, it's like across the street or whatever. And this, it's not that far away at all. Okay. Um, From you now? Huh? From you now? Um, I mean, is it not too far from where you live? No, no, no. I'm in Decatur, okay. but um, okay. I think the Mercedes Benz Stadium is close to East, um, is it East Point? I think something like that. Either way, I just remember going over the. Area. You know what? Heard the neighborhood Five Points? Huh? Her, have you heard of the neighborhood Five Points? Yes, but I'm not clicking on where that's at. Okay. I've heard it. I should have mentioned it's, it's downtown and it's not too far from the stadium. And I, because uh, I, I hadn't been in, in, in like a really long time. And while there, um, I, I hadn't been in that neighborhood. And I was saying, wow, Atlanta has a lot of, needs a lot of work because this is downtown. You yeah. have hotels and stuff, but it looked pretty rough for <laughs> a downtown area. Okay. Um, and yeah, not too far from a stadium. Yeah, um, yeah, yes, yes, that's the yeah. area. And I was thinking the same. I said, the stadium's right here, and I can. But then you look in the other area, like, which is, I want to say across the street. It's probably not that exactly, but it looks a little bit rough. And I'm just like, are, That's those, shocking. are those prices increasing because of the stadium? Like, how do they? I mean, I saw a condo building that I understand that, you know, the South and things are, you know, are naturally going to be cheaper. I saw some condos that were of a decent, that were of a decent price, mm -hmm. um, in my opinion. So um, that was, a, a bit surprising. I just found that very interesting. So you have a lot of, look, you got a lot of gentrification arguments and future yeah. ones <laughs> that'll yeah. be playing. Now, because there was an underground mall that used to be there, to my understanding, that was closed. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in that five points um, area. I think it was called the underground. Okay. Like, okay. Why am I sitting here studying that state <laughs> all the way up here? <laughs> I haven't heard of that one, but that's interesting. So I don't want to take up more of your time. I think we have like eight minutes left. Um, what would you say to conservatives who are like, no, gentrification is beautifying the area and, you know, making it better. And what would be- You'll be chased out of the room if you say that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I was one of those people where I, I didn't know any better. I think I said it to you before I created, I created Twitter account. I had, I branded a project in 2011 before I knew any better. And I was taken under someone's arm and I was told like to shut up and just listen to people for a while. I created Gentrify DC. It okay. was a Twitter account, <laughs> and Facebook. Gentrify DC. People cussed me out so good. What is this? <laughs> how do you, what, how is this like an acceptable thing? You actually think this is good? <laughs> people told me. It was embarrassing. That was funny. Um, uh -huh. But it, so it is deemed a negative thing in minority communities. I argued this with um, elected, with elected officials before, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, <laughs> there are so many negative ways that people weaponize policy mm -hmm. um, and weaponize policy and police, which is another one mm -hmm. to help drive certain people um, out of the community, it has a it has definite negative historical connotations. You should at least speak to people yeah. about you know what their concerns are. Some things possibly you know you, you might not be able to do something about, but yeah. there are definite concerns yeah. that need to be heard. And and stop denying people, um, <laughs> stop denying the issues that people come to you with. Because yeah. I would argue this is probably one of the largest ones that we have um, in our community because where you lay your head is literally in jeopardy. And that is not a fun scenario yeah. Um, to be in. Yeah, wow. You know, Vani, I love you and I love the nuance you bring to Twitter class. Um, and it, it just really helps expand what it is I'm trying to do in crafting some really great messaging when we do Black outreach. Um, I'll be sure to tell the team, do not mention gentrification. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding, but it, it's all. No, don't have, don't have an outreach meeting and someone's coming in and don't have someone come in saying, well, 
We're going to gentrify this neighborhood. <laughs> Who's with me? <laughs> Just don't do that. <laughs> I'm going to say, where's Bonnie at? He'll take care of you. Work with the people. Like, I, I just, I love you so very much. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. And um, beloveds, I hope you enjoyed this talk as well. We're always trying to figure out better ways to solve certain problems that don't involve this big government. Y'all know how much I hate big government. So uh, everyone take care and we'll have a new episode coming up very soon. Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. Anytime.